Hello, this is Jeff Evans taking you through the management account in the costing paper. This is sample one. Um, so here we go. So first one is Crest Paints Limited. It's got the following containers of red pig pigment in inventory. So it says the date purchase was November 28th, when they got 280 containers at £16 per container, which is £4,480. December the 4th, they got three, another 320 uh, uh, containers. And then December the 10th, another 160. And what I always advise uh, when doing these questions back in level two days is add up your quantities and add up your total cost because you need to know what your closing stock figure is going to be anyway. So it's always handy to do your total costs at first. Um, and then also to work out how many units you've got because when you do the AVCO figure, you need to work out the average cost overall so again so total up all your quantities first and that gives you 760 units that we've acquired okay you add up all the total cost which is 12,464 pounds so 760 units at a total cost of 12,464 it now says drag and drop the correct cost into the cost column of the table below to record issuing of 350 containers um, so we're going to do it on the on the 11th of december and to record the inventory balance after the issue so it wants to know what the cost of the issue is but then also what the closing balance figure is okay so the first one is avco so the average so as i said before if you've worked out your total cost first which is 12,464 and your total units was 760, then you can work out what your cost per unit is. Let's see if I can get a calculator for you, just to show you. Let's have a look. Ooh. Calculator. Okay, I'll move it over, just for any calculations we do. So again, as I said before, so you got 12,000, uh, so 12,464 was the total cost, and we've got 760 units. So divide that by 760, which is an average of £16.40 per unit. Okay, so there are 350 that have been issued out, which therefore means the cost of the issue is £5,740. Okay, we might also do the balance while we're here because we had 12,464, uh, 12, so I'll just minus it to save time, 12,464, so 6724, so the total cost, as I said before, was 12,464, but we've issued out 5,740, so that gives us a closing balance of 6724. I should do it properly, shouldn't I? So 1, 2, 4, 6, 4 is the total cost minus what we've issued out, which is 5740, which gives you 6724. Okay. The next one is FIFO. So the stock that came in first is the 270 containers at £16. So we know. The first 280 of those are 4,480 pounds, but we still need another 70. The stock that came in next was that on December the 4th, and that was 16 pounds 50. So we only want 70 of those. So if you go 70 times 16 pounds 50, which gives you 1,155. Add that to the November. Um, stock, so 4480, which gives you 5635. So the cost of the issue is 5635. Remember, you had your total cost before, so now you can work out your closing figure. So 12,464 minus 5635 is where you get the closing figure of 6829. Okay. The next one is to do with um, the extracts from Crest Paints Limited's payroll for last week. So it says we've got paint manufacturer 
uh, paint manufacturer even, and we've got production employees, so those that are producing, making the paint, uh, and it's 590 hours at £10 per hour. Uh, we've then got the canning and packing department, again, production employees, so again, direct labour, where we've got uh, 5,600 plus a 500 pound overtime. We've then got the stores department. So remember they're indirect costs because they're not, they don't make the paint, do they? They just uh, uh, sort of look after them in the stores, I suppose, don't they? And then we've got general admin um, department. So what you do is you basically have to work out some which, so complete the cost journals to record the four payroll payments last week. Um, I should always say, I always think that these debits are a bit like your costs, a bit like your expenses. So, what, so the first one is production employees and direct costs. Well, I'll show you all the different ones. So you get all of these drop-down menus, if you like. It's obviously paint manufacturer, so we can see here. So paint manufacturer direct costs, okay? And the other one is wages control because it's recorded in the wages. So we credit wages control. In fact, we do it for all of these. So again, treat the debits like an expense. So then you've got the canning and packing department. So again, it's a direct cost. And this time, their cost code is 6002. So that's direct cost. Again, credit wages control. For the stores department, this time it's an, it's an overhead, okay? And it's an operating overhead, as opposed because they are involved, but they are an overhead to the stores, isn't it? Because they're still involved in the paint process, I suppose, because that's where you store all your paint and all your stuff that comes in. So again, so we've got um, 7,000, so you can see. So these are the operating overheads, which is 2,300, so 2,000 plus a 15% bonus is 2,300. And then we credit the wages control account. General admin, so if you look at all of these other examples, it's quite, quite clearly, let's have a look. It's quite clearly not paint manufacturer, nor direct cost. It's not an operating overhead and it's not wages control. So not operating overhead because they have nothing at all to do with the actual making of the paint or involving the paint making process. So they're admin, so non operating. So again, 4,800, so 4,000 plus 20%. Okay, so again, think of it, the debits like your expenses, and then your credit wages control. Number 1.3. Okay, so 1.3, I've made some notes at the side as we're going along. So it's always worthwhile doing it on your paper as you do. So it said employees work in teams, and there are five employees each in the packing section of Crest Paints. They're paid a basic rate of £12 per hour, and any overtime is paid at the following rates. So overtime one, so it's the basic pay, which is £12 plus 50% which is obviously six, so you're paying 18 pound per hour, so far as the overtime rate one is concerned. For anybody who's on overtime rate two, it's double the basic base. Uh, for some of the younger people, they probably won't remember double pay. We used to get double pay for Saturday, uh, Sundays, you were time it off on a Saturday, but my how things have changed. Anyway, so overtime two, it's double the basic rate, so that's 24 pounds per hour. So all I've done here, yeah, so what is the basic pay? So we've got 700 hours. I put the obviously put the calculations in. So 700 are the hours times your basic pay. So that's times 12, which is 8,400. Your overtime one, as we said before, that's based upon 18 pounds an hour. So your you, you time and a half, if you like. So 600, so 60 hours times 18 pound is 1,080. And number two, as we said before, is double time. So double the basic rates. So 12 times two, so 24 pounds. So 30 times 24 pounds gives us 720 pounds in total. Okay. So now we can add them up. So we've got total uh, cost before bonus. So we've got these 790 hours in total. And the total cost is 10,200 pounds. Okay. So let's do the bonus. So it says CPL targets uh, sets a target for packing boxes of paint for each month. So a bonus equal to 25% of the basic hourly rate is payable for every box packed 
in the month in excess of target. So what's 25% of the basic hourly rate? So 12 divided by four. So three pounds per, per box, isn't it? Which is what we're gonna pay for every box over the excess. So it said the target for team three was 2,475. However, they actually packed 2,775 boxes. So they were quite efficient in that particular period, which means that they actually um, boxed, so they packed 300 more boxes. So 2,775 minus 2,475. So they did 300 more boxes than we're expecting. And they get three pound per box. So that's where the 900 pound comes in. That's the bonus payment. So then it says, so total uh, the total cost including the bonus, which is simply 10,200 plus 900, which gives you 11,100, which is the total cost including the bonus. Okay. The next one says, B, it says calculate the total labour cost of packing each box for the month of December. Okay, so it's basically, so how many boxes did they actually pack? 2,775, that's what they packed, didn't they? And what was the total cost? So the total cost is 11,100. And if you divide that by the 2,775, that gives you four pounds per box. So the total labor cost of packing each box is four pounds, okay? You can check that, can't you, by doing four times do two double seven five, which will take you back to the 11,100. So that's what the cost in relation to that is. The next one says, so complete the following sentence. Oh, so it's in the bit of it. It said there are five employees in each team of three. So in team three, there are five employees, which it says, up here, doesn't it? There are five employees. So it says, so the basic pay and overtime for each member in team three for December was, and all you're simply doing, it does say uh, the basic pay and overtime. So basic pay and overtime is, let me say, the basic pay and overtime for each member is what? This is before the bonus, remember? So it's just the basic pay and overtime. So it's 10,200, which is the basic pay and overtime. And you divide it by five, because there are five members of staff or five in the team, which is where you get 2,040 from. And then it says, and the annual, and the bonus payable to each member is simply the 900 pounds, which we did. So the bonus payment was 900 pounds. So there are five members of staff or five within the team, and that's where you get the 180 pounds. Okay. Not too bad, that question. Okay, this one is to do with uh, let's have a look. Cresta Pates calculates depreciation on a reducing balance and allocates a portion's other overheads using the most appropriate basis. So this is one of those questions that we used to call the three A's. So allocation, apportionment and absorption, okay? So where we can allocate the cost if they're given to us. Doesn't give you the, the method of doing them on here, but okay, when we're allocated costs, we can put them in directly. Then we apportion them, and then we reapportion them. So let's have a look. So this one says, complete the table below to identify the suitable basis for allocating or apportioning each overhead by se selecting the most appropriate option. So depreciation of mixed equipment. The depreciation is always, always, always done of the depreciate of the carried value. So what is the carried value of the asset? Okay, at this moment, at that moment in time. So you've got all of these different um, bases of apportionment. It's called, what is the fairest method for apportioning the overhead? And depreciation of mixing equipment is always on the best, on the basis of the carrying value of the mixing equipment. So what does it say in our statement of financial position of what the uh, carrying value of the asset is on the mixing equipment? Rent and rates is always done on floor area. So if you imagine, so when I'm teaching this, if you think of a factory, 
and it's got all these various departments and how much of that particular area is taken up by I don't know, what, what are these uh, cost centres so paint manufacturing or canning and packing so how much of the total area is taken up by these particular centres and that's what we do so we tend to do rates rent and rates or heat like heat light and power tend to be done on the basis of floor area quality control so again so quality control is obviously well in this example on the number of quality control inspections so obviously within the factory quality control will go out and check to see how many or to do inspections on the products to see that they are or the paint in this example to make sure that they are what they should be and that they are of a suitable quality um, can in equipment maintenance costs so maintenance costs are always done for the amount of times that the maintenance people spend in those particular cost centers yeah so therefore it's always done on the time spent so how many hours did they spend maintaining the equipment in the calling department so that's why it's done on time spent and similarly in relation to the calling equipment insurance costs so this is to do with insurance costs and obviously that's based upon the value of the particular assets so this one is done on the carrying value of the calling equipment carrying value of the calling equipment because it tells you calling equipment so insurance costs because obviously that's based upon what the insurance premiums you're going to pay to insure them to whatever the value is hopefully that's okay we can mark that five marks a mark each okay it now says that crest paints is already allocated and apportioned its current overhead cost for the next quarter as shown in the table below these costs have yet to be reapportioned to the two profit centres. Uh, so the two profit centres are paint manufacturer and canning and packing. So before I did these calculations, it was up to that point, so you had your totals in. So what they've done, the depreciation of the equipment, depreciation of the equipment, which they would have done on the carry value, but they've already done the apportionment. So they have apportioned the cost on the fairest basis. Okay, again, heat and light, rent and rates, they would have been done on floor area. Admin costs, you would have allocated them because you would have known what they are. And then the indirect labor costs, they tend to be given to you as well. So we tend to allocate those. So if you do another question where you're not given this information, read the question carefully because you'll find a lot of the time, you know, so some students sometimes, where are admin costs going to go? And some students will then try to portion it to different cost centres, but obviously admin costs is obviously with general admin. Um, An indirect labour cost, they tend to give you those, so you put them in. Okay, so the point being in relation to this question is that you basically you've allocated and you've apportioned. We've, we've given all these totals. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to reapportion. And the first one is to reapportion the general admin. And you notice the general admin overhead is now £674,000. So they've apportioned and reapportioned, added all these together. So £674,000. So we're going to reapportion these overheads now to the other cost centres in the way that it tells us to. Another question it tells us. It said the general admin uh, department services two profit centres, so paint and canning, uh, bu, 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 maintenance and store, sorry, the general, I'll read that again. The general admin department services two profit centres, so paint manufacture and canning, the maintenance department and the stores department. He said these are apportioned on the basis of 40% to make paint manufacture, 40% to canning and profit, uh, sorry, canning and so it's hard to say that to canning and packing profit center and then 10 percent each to maintenance of the stores so all we're saying is what's this for this is for general admin so general administration so 40 percent of their time is spent within paint manufacturer and 40 percent in canning so you do 40 percent of six hundred seventy-four thousand pounds gives you £269,000. So that's how we get those figures. And it tells us that the 10% is also spent in maintenance 
and 10% in store. So as you can see, so 10% of 674,000 is 67,400 each, okay? So we've reapportioned the general admin, so that's now gone. And now we're going to reapportion the stores because the ultimate aim of allocation, apportionment and reabsorption is to end up with all of the costs within the two profit centers. So therefore we can then absorb them using the fairest method. But that's what we tend to do. So, so far as reapportioning the stores is concerned, how we're going to reapportion the stores? And it says the stores are reapportioned on the basis of inventory requisition, which is usually the case. So inventory requisitions is how many orders do each of those departments make? So the profit center expects to have 8,280 requisitions. So they're going to fill out 8,280 requisition forms and calling and packing are expected to have 5,250. Okay, so what we do again, so this time remember to add, because a lot of students forget this part. So you've got those 356,000 plus the reapportioned stores, which is 67,400, which gives us a total of 423,400. So I've missed one, I do apologize. Is that what their stores are doing though, won't we? So same process for so the stores was 336,000 plus the 67,400 from the book uh, uh, that we reported from General Admin, which means the total overhead now in stores is 403,400. How are we going to reapportion that? So let me tell you. What you do is you add together the requisitions so you know what the total amount of requisitions was overall. So you've got 8,280 plus 5,520, which gives you a total requisitions or material requisitions of 13,800. So 13,800, okay? Of which, in fact, I'll get the calculator again for you. So just to show you. So the total is 8,000, 280 in the first one in profit in paint manufacture plus 5520. So 13,800 is the total amount of requisitions. So then what you do, so how many requisitions were done by paint manufacturing? So it was 8,280. You divide it by the total amount, which is 13,000. 800, okay, equals, and then you multiply it by the actual overhead. So what's the overhead? It's, four, it's 403,000. So 403, 400, which is 242,040. Okay, I would normally ask you to work out the next one, but I know that you know. So we've done the 8,280, which is out of the 13,800. And now you're doing, so how many is Callaghan packing? So you would go 5,000 for the next one. So out of the 13,800, so 5,520, okay, divided by the total amount, which is 13,800 equals... So that's 40%, it's the same thing. And then multiplied by 403,400. Oh, that's where you get 161,360 from, okay? So you've done that. So you've reapportioned the stores to the maintenance and the two uh, profit centers. And that leaves us just with the maintenance now. So 356,000 plus... 67,400, which gives us 423,400. So how's maintenance done? So the maintenance department reapportions costs on the basis of maintenance hours, as you would do, okay? So the paint manufacturer profit center expects to use 7,000 maintenance hours. Remember, these are all budgeted figures. And the Callaghan Packing profit center expects to use 5,500 
maintenance hours. So most of the time is spent in paint manufacture. So therefore it's only fair that of this 423,400, that they have most of it because they spend most of the time in paint manufacture. So again, similar process. So I always do the, add them together first because then you know what you're doing. It's in proportion, isn't it? So 7,000 is the total hours that are spent in paint manufacture, plus 5,500. So the total amount of hours was 12,500, okay? So 12,500, how many hours of those 12,500 are spent in paint manufacture? 7,000 here you say, yeah? So 7,000 hours out of, the 12,500 equals it's about 56%. And then multiply by what we multiply it by four, two, three, four hundred, which gives you 237,104. Similarly, so for the next one, I know you know, you're going to do 5,500 divided by 12,500, so the total amount, and then multiply it by the 432,400, and that gives you 186 point, so 186,296, okay? So therefore, we've apportioned, so we've allocated, should we say, we've apportioned, and then we've reapportioned, and we've got where we want to now, where we've got all of the overheads, in the two uh, profit centers. So you add all of those figures together, which again, where quite a few students go wrong, add them all together, which gives you 1,979,744 of the total overheads in paint manufacture. Canning and packing is 2,078,256. Again, add them all together. So they are the overheads in relation to these profit centers. We then normally absorb them, okay, but we tend to, in, in, the, in the older days, if you like, it, it used to be related to this particular question where it tells you that paint manufacturing is very machine intensive and canon is very labor intensive. And then you would basically divide them by the hours to work out what would be called your over absorption rate, which is sort of similar to the next question. So how much do I need to charge just to cover my overheads, okay? So what we tend to have, which you'll see later, we have our direct costs, and direct labor, direct materials and direct expenses, otherwise known as prime costs. And then we need to know, so how much do we need to add to cover the overheads, okay? Such as these, like heat and light. You know, if you think of that, there's a, there's a really good case done a few years ago about hairdressers. So they know what they're gonna charge per hour. Okay, they know the materials they're going to use, so they know what the direct costs are going to be. But they've got a overhead to pay, such as the, the rent, okay? So how are they going to incorporate the cost when they cut somebody's hair, you know, to cover the overhead, i.e. the rent? And they did that on labour hours, okay? So the, you'll see in the next example of how we do it to a certain extent. Okay, this one says another over, overhead is machine running costs, okay? So machine running costs, another overhead. And it said the estimated cost for the next quarter is £630,000, which consists of a fixed element and a variable element. The fixed element is 60% of the total cost and the rest is variable. So do that first. So let's have up. So £630,000 times 60%, in fact, I'll show you. So we go 630,000 pounds times 60%, so multiply by 0 0.6, is 378,000 pound is the fixed element, okay? And obviously the remainder would be the variable element, but I'll leave it up there just to show you. So it tells us the fixed element of the total cost is to be reapportioned to paint manufacture profit center and canning profit center um, and the ratio of 56 to 44, okay? So the ratio of 56 to 44. So what you do is you add them together. So for the 
plate uh, body fracture, they, theirs is 50, 56%, isn't it? So the fixed element of the total cost is to be a portion between paint body fracture and the canning center on a ratio of 56 to 44. So you add them together, which just in this example equals 100. So 56 of the 100, so 56% is, uh, is spent in, so 56 of the cost is to paint manufacture and 44% would have gone to canning and packing profit center. So all I've done for that one, is because it wants us to know what's the fixed element of the machine running cost to paint manufacture. So paint manufacture is 56 out of 100, which is 56%, so times 0.56. And that's where I get the 211,680, yeah? The variable element, so the variable element of the machine cost is reportioned to the canning profit center. And this one says the variable element is a 62.38. So it just so happens it equals 100 again. So let's show you what we did before. So we did 630,000, didn't we? And we said 60% was fixed and the remainder, so 40% is variable. So times 0.4, which is 252,000. And it said the variable element apportioned to canning and packing. So canning and packing is they're the 38% or the 30 of the 100, if you like. So I'm going to multiply that by 38%. So stay again, 62. So the total cost is apportioned 62 to paint manufacture and 38 to canning and packing. And we're doing canning and packing. So it's 38 out of the 100. Again, it just works out nicer this one to be 100, but that could say 38 to something else. You add them together first, and then what proportion? So times 0.38 equals, so that's where I get the 95,760. Okay, halfway there. 1.5. So this is the uh, overabsorption rate now. So how much do we need to um, charge just to cover our overheads? So remember, these are budgeted figures, okay? So we've got, I'll turn the table. So Crest Paints Limited has the following information about its two profit centers. So we've got budgeted labor hours, budgeted machine hours, but then we've got actual. So this is what we actually did. Our budgeted overheads were 185,000, but our actual overheads were 179,425. So that's for packing and similar process in relation to canning and packing. So that's paint manufacture. So it says calculate the budgeted over absorption rate for paint manufacture profit center based on machine hours. So it's telling you the question that the budgeted overheads for paint manufacture is based upon machine hours. So the budgeted overhead is 185,375. And the budgeted, what is it, machine hours? They say budgeted machine hours is 2966. So 185,375 divided by 2966 gives you £62.50. So that's our budgeted over absorption rate. So remember, budgeted is the key. So budget, don't be using actual, use budgeted, because it tells you that in the question. But all we're basically saying is what should we budget? So what should our over absorption rate be? So that basically means that we need to charge £62.50 per hour just to cover our overheads. That doesn't include direct costs, just the over absorption rate. Okay. Canning and packing which is done on labour hours. So this one is done on labour hours. So look at our overheads. So our budget overheads are 223,060. And this time our budgeted labour hours were 8864, which means we need to charge £25.16 per hour just to cover the overheads in the Calling and Packing Department because it is very labour intensive. Whereas the first one is very machine intensive. So just have a look at what the uh, basis of absorption will be. Okay. Now suppose it said 
for quarter two, the overabsorption rate for paint manufacturer profit center has been based upon direct labor hours um, and was 28 pounds per hour. I'll read that again. Now suppose for quarter two, that the overabsorption rate for paint manufacturer profit center had been based upon direct labor hours and was 28 pounds, okay? So, do, 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 do. Right, so it would be it was 28 pounds. And then the actual overheads were 213,200 pounds and the actual hours work 7,400. So let's have a look. what do we need to do first? So the first thing we need to do is, so it tells us the actual overheads are 213,200. So I've just put that in there. So the actual overheads incurred were 213,200, yeah. Okay, and it says, so imagine that the overabsorption rate was 28 pounds per hour. How many hours did we actually do? Yeah, because it was based on labor hours. So how many hours did they do? How many hours did they actually do? They did, tells you that, oh yeah. So the actual labor hours were 7,400. So 28 pounds per hour, that's the overabsorption rate. And it, they actually work 7,400 hours. So you multiply it by the 28, which is where you get 207,200. Okay, I'll take a step back. Didn't explain that well. So the overabsorption rate, which is based upon direct labor hours, was 28 pounds per hour. Okay, that was the overabsorption rate. That's based on budget. So you need to look at it. So how many hours did they actually do? Because remember, the budgeted overheads are based upon a budgeted figure, aren't they? And it said, so, but you've got actual now. So 28 pounds an hour times your actual hours worked was 7,400, which is 202,000. So 207,200. So let's have a look. So you've incurred your actual overheads, 213,200, but you've only absorbed 207,200, yeah? Your overhead came in at 213,200, but you've only absorbed 207,200. So you've underabsorbed by 6,000 pounds, okay? You still need to pay for that. So it would still be an expense. You still have to pay it, yeah? Because that's what your actual cost is. So you've underabsorbed. Okay. Next one says, refer to quarter one at the start of the task and complete the following sentence. So in quarter one, the overheads for Canning Profit Center were, so let me show you. So we've got uh, quarter one, do, 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 do. I'll show you what we do. So as far as the overheads are concerned, so let's see. So 25 pounds 16, is the budgeted overhead. So this is what I'm saying before. So you've got your budgeted against your actual. So let's have a look. So 25 pounds 16 is what we charge so far as our overabsorption rate. And that was based upon, was that based upon labor hours, wasn't it? Our budgeted, uh, budgeted labor hours. But we actually did 8,000 hours instead of 8,864. So we've charged 25 pounds 16, yeah? Um, which was for the 8,864, 8, but how much did we actually charge? So what you do is 25 pounds 16 times the actual hours, which is 8,000 hours, which gives you 201,280. Say that again. So our budgeted overabsorption rate was 25 pounds 16. That's what we've charged, yeah? Based upon budgeted hours, but we know what the hours are now. So we've charged £25.16 for every hour, but they only did 8,000 hours, not 8,864. So you multiply that by the uh, £25.16, which again gives you 201,280. Okay. That's what you basically, um, that's what the actual cost is. But your budgeted figure was 200, sorry, start again. Your actual figure was 215,404. Say again. 
Over absorption rate, £25.16. Times your actual hours, so you've actually charged 201,280. No, that's what you've charged, okay? That's what you've absorbed. But your actual overhead was 215,404, which is where that difference come from. So you've underabsorbed, haven't you? Yeah, because you've only absorbed 201,280, but your actual overhead was 215,404. Hopefully you'll understand that. I didn't explain it particularly well, but again, I'm not going to go over it again, but your overhead absorption rate, £25.16, times the actual hours that you did, so it was 8,000, so that's what you've absorbed, but then you find out that your actual was 215,000. The difference between them is 14,124, which means you've underabsorbed. You've not charged enough. You're going to need to increase your overabsorption rate next year to cover the overheads. Okay. And that's what we do in relation to that question. Number six. 1.6. Okay. So this one is to do with marginal costing. So it said Crest Paint is planning to launch a new water resistant emulsion paint for bathrooms and kitchens called WR52. And they will be manufactured in batches of 50,000 cans. The following cost estimates are being produced per batch of WR52. So we've got direct materials and direct labor otherwise known as prime costs and so direct materials, direct labour, direct, direct expenses if we had them. So direct costs added together are what we call our prime cost. So we've got direct materials, we've got variable production overheads, and then we've got fixed. I'll show you what we do with these as we're going along. So the first thing says calculate the estimated prime cost per batch. And I said before, prime cost, your direct costs added together, which is simply 103000 plus 105 is 208,000 pounds. So you start off with your prime cost first. For marginal costing, you then add your variable costs, okay? So prime cost plus your variable costs gives you your marginal cost per batch. So all I've done is the 208,000 plus 84,000 gives us 292,000. Okay, so calculate the estimate of marginal cost. So 292,000. What we do with marginal costing is basically, obviously, it's to do with contribution, is it? So whatever your, whatever your sales revenue is, minus your production cost will give you your contribution, does it? And then you take off your fixed costs after with marginal costing. With absorption costing, though, is you include the fixed cost within your cost per unit or cost per batch. Okay, so marginal, you leave the, fi uh, the fixed costs until the end, so you take them off contribution. With absorption costed, you include it. So again, all we're doing for the absorption costed is your 292 plus your fixed costs, your 34,000. So that's where your 326,000 comes in. So prime cost, direct costs added together. You add your, your variable cost, to work out what your marginal cost for production would be, not fixed costs, but then for your absorption cost, you add your fixed cost to it as well. And that's where you get three, two, six. A lot of the questions are like that. So you need to know that, you know, of, how, of the difference between the marginal cost and the full absorption cost. Next one. It says now calculate the estimated marginal cost of one can of WR2 and round to two decimal places. So we've got, as far as the actual cost is concerned, so 292,000 is the marginal cost. Got the calculator again for you. So 292,000 is the marginal cost. And there are 50,000 cans in a batch, which gives you £5.84 is the cost per can, okay? Similarly, so far as the next question, which is to do the absorption cost per can, all you're going to do this time is your 326. So again, so 326, one, two, three, divided by 50,000, 
gives you £6.52. So you see the difference between them? That's because marginal cost doesn't take into account the fixed costs because they take it off contribution. But absorption cost does, okay? So that's what we do. Couple of uh, little questions now. There's three marks, so not necessarily. So this one says, which of the following would never be included in CPL's inventory valuation? So inventory, so material, isn't it? So we know that obviously the marginal cost would because we did it before with material includes prime cost, doesn't it? Prime cost does include materials and obviously product cost, but your period costs um, don't, okay? It's just, so just think about it logically. So which cost would never be included in, in materials or inventory valuation? Next one says, which of these is an example of unethical behavior of, of CPL's accounting technician? So calculating profits objectively rather than subjectively. That's fair enough. That's okay, isn't it? So in an objective point of view, valued inventory to maximize the period uh, profits. So no, you can't chop and change. You need to Make sure you stick to the same valuation method. So that would be unethical. Uh, treating CPL's costs as confidential, obviously that would be ethical, so that one's fine. And then allocating the cost between the products objectively. So again, again, that one's fine. So the answer to that one is that, uh, that one there, uh, valuing inventory to, to maximise costs. Next one says, why might CPL decide to allocate its costs between products of different departments, okay? So um, segmented, it says to report segmented profit or losses. I'm just trying to think, you know, particularly like we did some work quite recently on Microsoft accounts and obviously Microsoft have got different products. So different segments of their business. So you want to know how well those particular segments are doing in comparison to others. So how's the iPhone doing in comparison to, to LinkedIn or Office 365 and things? So the other, the different segments, you want to report them separately. So you can work out, you know, what profits and losses are being made in each segment. Sometimes you might need to close them down because some of them are losses and they can loss. But again, so for segmental purposes, it helps to split the costs up. So you can work out, how well they're doing or not. Next one says, CPL's uh, paint manufacturing department is a profit center. Which of the following does its management control? Okay, so it's a profit center. So hopefully from your level two days, then the profit center is cost and revenues, isn't it? A cost center is just costs, isn't it? So it's cost and revenues in a profit center. We also did investment center, if you remember rightly. At level two. So if this one, because it gets costs and revenues, it's a profit center, the profit center. Really there. 1.7, so break even, so on and so forth. So choose the correct description, six marks for this, two marks each, uh, for each of the three acts. So contribution, as you're sure you know, is selling price, less, less variable costs. Yep, so selling price less variable costs. How do you work out break even? Just out of interest, it's not in the question. But break even is your fixed costs divided by contribution. And your contribution is your selling price less your variable cost. So, what is your break even revenue? Okay, so break even says so it's a sales revenue where there's never there's neither a profit nor a loss. So, you know, so at break even, so it was under, when I'm in class, I tend to draw a break even chart. So you can see the total cost, total revenue, fixed cost, and you can see it pictorially, if you like. Have a look at it in one of the books. So you can see that break even is where your total cost equals your total revenue. So you're not making any money, but you're also not losing any money. Okay. Whereas your margin of safety is based the difference between your excess, so any sales over your break even. So if your break even was 2,000 units, but you sold 3,000 units, or your target was to sell 3,000 units, then you've got a 1,000 difference, a margin of safety, if you like, haven't you? Again, have a look at some of the graphs, because that explains it particularly well. Margin of safety. Okay, so Crest Paints manufactures MP16, a marine paint for boats. 
It says MP6 deed is made in batches of 10,000 cans, each of which is sold for five pounds. Okay. Do, 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 do. Batch of 5,000, but they sell each for five pounds. The following costs are involved in the manufacture. So this is based upon 10,000 units though. So we've got direct materials, we've got direct labor, and we've got variable overheads, and we've got fixed overheads. So again, you need to know what's the formula for break even. So break even is your fixed costs divided by your contribution. So you have to work out, remember your selling price, contribution is selling price minus variable costs. So what you do, because these is based on 10,000 units. So if you add all of your variable costs together, so such as your direct materials, your direct labor, and your variable overheads, I'll do it for you so you can see. So let's have it got 4,810 direct, material, direct material. Our labor is 7,508. And our variable overheads are 7,682, which is 20,000 pounds. So our variable costs are 20,000 pounds. Remember, that's for 10,000 cans, isn't it? So we want to work it out per can because we sell them for five. So if we divide that by 10,000, then obviously you're going to get two pounds per can, aren't you? So two pounds per can. So that's your variable cost per unit. So back to what we said before. So selling price is five pounds minus your variable cost, which is two pounds, gives you a contribution of three. Okay. So your contribution is three pounds. So 50, so we had 57,000, which is your fixed costs, divided by your contribution, which is three, which is where you get your 19,000 um, units from. So you need to sell 19,000 units before you break even. What's that in sales revenue? Again, students get a bit confused with this. It's really just saying, so what would the sales revenue be at the break even point? What did you sell the cans for? Not what the cost is. It says, what did you sell them for? You sold them for five pounds per can, didn't you? So 19,000 times five, is where you get your sales revenue is 95,000 pounds at that point, okay? It now says for the next one, CPL also manufactures and sells marine paint, which is MP17, okay? It says, boom, 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 boom. This, this is manufactured in batches of 12,000 uh, 12,000 cans and makes a contribution of 42,000 per batch. Okay. Um, fixed costs are 56,000 pounds. So it says CPL has a target profit of 51,000, sorry, 31,500 for manufacturing and selling this paint. So we still need to work out what the break even would be. I know you don't need to, but it helps to do the manufacturing, sorry, to do your margin of safety. So let's have a look what the actual break even figure will be. So, what we do, so we want to know what the, it tells us the contribution is 42,000 per batch, isn't it? and there's 12,000 cans in the batch. Let me show you. So, 42,000 pounds is the total contribution per batch divided by the 12,000 cans, which is so £3.50. So £3.50 is the contribution per can, okay? So we're making £3.50 for each can that we sell. So we know what the contribution is now, £3.50. You're going to divide your fixed costs by 56,000, just to show you, just because I think it's good practice. So 56,000 divided by 3.5. Would be 16,000, would be how many you would need to sell to break even. Okay. And this one is saying calculate the margin of safety if CPL sells 20,000 cans. So 16,000 to break even. If they were to sell 20,000 cans, then you've got 4,000, which is your margin of safety, isn't it? 
Again, if you see it on the graph, you'll see the line if you break even, and then you line for your forecast sales, if you like, and then you can work out what the actual margin of safety is. So 4,000 is the margin of safety in relation to CADs. For a profit, again, some students struggle with this. So we don't want to break even. So 16,000 CADs to break even. We want to make a profit of 31,500, okay? All you simply do is just add your target profit to your fixed costs. So 56,000 to your fixed costs. I want to make a profit of 31,500, which is 87,500. The contribution is still £3.50. So divided by £3.50, we're making £3.50 for every can, which is where I need to sell 25,000 cans to make a profit of 31,500. So just add the target profit to the fixed costs. Okay, that's all you need to do. Early there. Okay, 1.8. One point eight is to do with cost behavior, I suppose. It said the following eight options describe the behavior of different types of costs during a short period of one quarter in the year. So fixed costs. So which one of those explains it the best? So we know that fixed costs are those costs that stay the same yeah, over a period out, such as rent and rates. But what happens to the cost per unit at that point? So we know that the cost... As you, as you know, it's basically spread over more units. So that is basically where the, so it's that other option for, so it decreases as per volume, okay? So what we're looking at, so different types of costs over a short period of one quarter. So fixed costs, so the cost per unit reduces, doesn't it, over the volume, because you're splitting those fixed costs over the greater volume. So it, it turns out to be, the cost per unit decreases. I'm sure you'll have seen that in previous studies, but it does, it decreases because those fixed costs are spread over the greater volume, okay? Variable cost, you know, so variable cost change with output. So it increases in total as volume increases. So we're going to be level two day. So variable costs increased proportionally with output, which is that one. Semi-variable cost, which you know has got a fixed element and a semi variable element, so made up of fixed and variable costs, such as your heating and all of those things where you've got your standard charge, which is fixed, with an obviously, and it's bloody expensive now, isn't it, because it's all gone up? So your electricity, the new variable bit, would be your cost per unit. And then step costs, which is fixed over a certain volume range. So step costs, we tend to talk about uh, to do with supervisors of these, don't we? So a fixed cost might be supervisor's salary, say £30,000 a year, but they can only supervise so many staff. So if the business gets really, really busy, we need to take on another supervisor, it steps up another 30000 That's what we mean. So it, it, it goes up fixed, up to a certain range only. That's really by step costs. It goes about that, doesn't it? Same with uh, with with rent. So your shops do particularly well. You pay twenty seven thousand pound a year. When you get so so busy, you need to open another shop. That it just steps up. And that's what we mean in relation to step costs. I do like this question because it was in the. It used to be in the synoptic. Um, it was definitely the synoptic. We had to do it on the spreadsheet. But anyway, so flex budgets. So he said Crest Paint is a budgeted manufacturer to sell 50,000 cans of gloss paint, uh, GL78, in December. However, due to a shortage of solvent, it only is able to manufacture 45,000 cans. CPL's manufacturing costs are all variable, except for its fixed overheads. So let's complete the table below to show the flex budget of the resulting variances. So I've put all these figures in, with obviously with the exception of that one, okay? So all we're doing here is, so let's, let's show you. So these are our budgeted figures. So the original budget was for 50,000 cans, which would give us sales revenue of 225,000 pounds. Your direct materials would be 45,200 and so on and so forth. 
So what you need to work out is what your sales revenue per can was budgeted to be, what were your direct labour costs for 50,000 cans, and how much should it cost you now you've only produced 45,000 cans. So I'll show you what we do. So if you sales revenue, so you work out your sales revenue first. So what was your selling price per unit? So watch. So if we go, so 225,000. So that was the sales revenue for 50,000 cans divided by 50,000 equals £4.50. So we budgeted our sales revenue to be £4.50 per unit. So how much revenue should we make for 45,000 cans? So all you do is multiply that by 45,000, which equals 202,500. So all that means if we'd charging £4.50 per can, yeah, we should have made 202,500. Okay, based on 45,000 cans. We do the same because we flex it to take into account the cans that we actually sold in it, or manufactured, should I say. So we manufactured 45,000. Same as before. So if you direct materials and labour, so what was the cost? It was 45,200. And that was based upon 50,000 cans. Okay, which is 0 0.904. So that was what 90 pence, just over 90 pence per can. Multiply it by 45,000. So it should have been 90 pence per can. So how much should it have cost us for 45,000 um, cans? So times 45,000. It should have cost us 40,680. Similarly, with variable overheads. So 36,400 is what it should have cost us for 50,000 cans, okay? So just over 73 pence per can. Again, best thing with your calculators, don't round it up, just to leave it as it is. And then multiply it by the 45,000 cans. So times 45,000. So what should it have cost us for 45,000 cans? It should have cost us 32,000 760 tells you the question that the fixed overheads are not variable so that stays the same so just copy a fixed cost straight across and then you can basically do all your calculations so your sales revenue is would it, it should be 202,500 for 45,000 cans minus your costs should give you a profit from operations of 54,260 but then you get your actual figures. So again, the actual figures are given to you as all the budgeted figures. So how much money should we have made for 45,000 cans? We should have made 202,500. What did we make? We made 207,400. Is that good? It is, isn't it? And you only expected to make 202,500, but you actually made 207,000. So you made 4,900 more than you expected. So remember that sales revenue cost. Be careful. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, how much should it have cost us in direct materials and labour? Forty-five thousand pounds. It should have cost us forty thousand pounds based upon the budgeted figures we did before. But it actually cost us forty-six thousand one hundred sixty. So it cost us more than we expected. So that will be an, an, an adverse variance. So it's cost us five thousand. 480 more than we expected. Variable overheads, similarly. So we expected it to cost us 32,000, but it only cost us 31. So that's a positive variance of 1,150. And you fixed, we expected them to be 74,800, but they were actually 75,300. So it's cost us 500 pounds more than we expected. That's what that will mean. So next question says, referring to this particular question above, what do you think had the greatest impact on the profit from operations? Okay. Well, sales revenue was good because it's 4,900. So I suppose that could help with your profit, couldn't it? So I suppose that's one of the things. 
And the other question said, so which of the following might have caused the variance for direct materials and labour? Okay, so uh, let's have a look. See what options you've got. So decrease the material price would have the opposite effect, wouldn't it? Because it would have that would have been would have been beneficial. A decrease in employees' pay, that would also have been beneficial. And more efficient use of labor would have been beneficial. So it's an increase, an increase in the material prices could be well, the other one of those that would have caused the variance, okay, or the adverse variance. Nearly there. 1.10. Okay, so again, you have to drag the boxes and say is the R. I remember doing this one in class a few years ago. There we go. So let's have a look. So let's see, we've got payback period. So it says the company policy is 2.5 years, but the project result is three years. So you never go ahead with a, an investment appraisal. So you're thinking of capital investment projects. And it's based upon the decision of the three appraisal methods. The results are shown below. So our company policy is we would go ahead with an investment if it's within two and a half years. This one is expected to be three years. So we reject it because it's more than the company policy of 2.5 years. Okay. Net present value. So whenever we get net present value that's positive, we always go ahead with the investment. Okay. So this one has got, uh, uh, it says accept if it's positive, but it's got a 50,000 positive variance. So therefore we accept it because it's positive. And then the final one is to do the internal rate of return. So discount of 15% of capital. So it must exceed the cost of the capital. So it's going to cost us 15% if we're going to borrow that money for this capital expenditure. And it reckons it's only going to give us a 14% return. So you're not going to spend something that's going to cost you 15% to get 14% back, are you? So you're going to reject it because it's less than the cost of capital. You know, the cost of capital is less. It's only going to be more. So you want it to be more to give you a positive, don't you? So this go up 15%. If it was 17%, you'd be interested because it means you get a return of 17%, 2% more than the cost. But this one's less than the cost. So you'd never go ahead with it, okay? So what would you do overall, okay? And this one is one that always tends to cause an interesting conversation. We accept it as the most important investment criterion, which is the net present value. And the reason why we accept it, even though the other two were negative, is because net present value takes into account the time value of money. So you know from previous, or when you be doing this unit, hopefully, that when you do net present value, you discount those cash flows to take into account the time value of money. So the net present value is the most efficient method of appraising the capital appraisals, okay? All right, so um, hopefully you found that helpful. Um, I will scan my notes and send them through on uh, Thingamajig, on YouTube if I can. So if I can, if I can send them in any way, I will do, because I've done all my calculations on my notes as well, all right? So hopefully you found it useful. Thanks very much. Good luck in your studies.